Deciding to Major in Computer Science with Nick Orlowski. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast, deliver quality, and run your software with confidence in Azure all while using everything that the .NET ecosystem has to offer. The podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure, a software architecture company empowering .NET teams to be self-sufficient and able to deliver world-class results. ClearMeasure is hiring architects as well as .NET engineers who'd like a path to become an architect. So you can go to clearmeasure.com slash careers for that. And our guest today on the show is Nick Orlowski. Uh, Nick is a rising sophomore college student at the University of Texas in Austin, and he's majoring in computer science, and he knew from an early age that uh, programming would be his career calling. Uh, He was a leader in his high school computer science classes and even competed in the Microsoft Imagine Cup competitions, also UIL competitions, hackathons, and and much, much more. Uh, And he currently, uh, through his schoolwork, works for various companies on programming projects uh, while taking classes at at UT and is currently spending this summer programming uh, for Home Depot Corporate. So Nick, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. well. Thanks for, thanks for, uh, for, for coming on. Um, And uh, I'll I'll kind of by way of intro where you and I met, uh, I've been a mentor to, the uh to the high school that you went to and kind of Mm -hmm. introduced to you and some of the other classmates and i've been a guest speaker at some of the computer science classes at that high school and that's when we first met but you knew way before high school that you kind of liked computers and you kind of liked programming but when did you know what what was your what was your first foray where you said okay i really like this 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 is what i'm going to do yeah, well, I guess it goes back to, I, I mean, the first time I ever programmed was probably elementary school and it was, you know, basic, basic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think me and my friends wanted to like make a video game or something because, you know, we played video games like all kids. Um, and, you know, we kind of had like journals of like stuff we thought would be cool. Um, like, I think we actually had, like filled like three or four journals of like, you know, things we would want to build in a game. And obviously it's stuff, you know a fourth grader could, you know, never program. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, at one point we were like, you know, well, if we were going to make this, who's going to program it? And I was the one who kind of took that step. And I I think I initially got into Python was the first language I learned. Mm -hmm. And I I followed a couple of tutorials online of just like building like, I think a hangman game and, you know, your your typical beginner stuff. And at that point I wasn't too, um, you know, really attached to it yet i guess Mm -hmm. and then i think probably later like a year later um i got into working with um unity which is a game engine that mostly utilizes c sharp for its um the aspects where you're actually writing code right and that you know you can have 3d stuff there and it was pretty easy to do if you had tutorial to follow along with or like some documentation and at that point like you know i thought you know you, you could build a lot of stuff with you know a fifth grader at the time, um, just w- with coding, you know, I thought that was really cool. And like at one point, like I-, I can't remember exactly when it was, but everything just kind of like clicked of how stuff worked, where I didn't have to like kind of lean on tutorials as much. I could just kind of figure out like you know by ways of like reading through documentation and just you know basic logic of how to write programs without really needing to you know, copy as much code from others. I mean, obviously you never get to zero on that, but Mm -hmm. you know, you can start doing your own thinking. Right. Right. And yeah, so I guess that's really when I kind of fell in love with it. And around then, um, I think I would try and spend recesses like inside, um, like in the computers in the library writing. I'm like, uh, they didn't have like any IDs installed. So you had to use like scripting language on the computers. Mm -hmm. You could like, you know, write scripts, like play like a text game or something. 
And I eventually got banned from the computers for doing that in elementary school because <laughs> I guess the teachers didn't like having like a terminal open, which I guess is understandable. Right. Um, but yeah, I think that's really around when I started to really fall in love with programming. Okay. And from, from my observation, there's high school students that take a computer science class, and there's plenty of those. And then there's people where it's almost like that's all you want to do and you just have to take your other classes because it's required and you got to get through them. Um, where were you on that spectrum? Yeah, I was, you know, I was really into computer science. Like I, I most of my time spent at home, I would be working on, you know, that one project that I worked with you on cab cash. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would register, I think I took almost every computer science course I could. I think there were a couple of ones that I didn't get to just because I had to fill my schedule with other stuff. But I think junior year of high school, I was able to get like around half my schedule. Yeah, half of my schedule outside of like um, cross country, which took up two class periods, Mm -hmm. was computer science related classes. And that was a really fun semester for me. Um, You know, I got to learn a lot in those classes. Well, the Microsoft Imagine Cup just kind of concluded for this year in 2022. Um, But you know, for those who might be interested in doing it next year. Um, it, is it hard to enter? What was your experience with, with Microsoft's Imagine Cup and, and deciding to and then actually uh, getting into that competition? Yeah, I forget where we first heard about it, but I mean, it was pretty easy to enter. I mean, um, we, they have like a couple of prompts you have to fill out and you have to write a little, um, like I think one or two page document about like the tech you use and kind of like a business pitch for it. And then you, you obviously had to build a demoable software. I don't think it had to be too complete, just enough for a good demo. Mm-hmm. And uh, you could record like a one minute or 90 second pitch video, something like that. So it was pretty easy to get into. I mean, as long as you have a solid idea in a team, I think you have a pretty good shot at it. Okay. Now, from my memory, you did more than just a demoable application. Yeah. You were... <laughs> So, um, what, what would be your recommendation for how big of a project that, that people should attempt for Imagine Cup? Yeah. For Imagine Cup. I don't know. Cause I think the ones that win are usually like college students who have like, they've done some like research tied to it. Mm-hmm. Um, like I think one from the year we entered was had something to do with like insulin, um, like automatic insulin injection. So, I, I mean, I guess I can't gauge it too well, but something you put like a lot of thought into, like they're really looking for um, big projects there with the potential to do a lot. Mm-hmm. I think ours was kind of below that bar because it was mostly doing stuff that was already being done. I mean, we had a couple of cool features that, you know, um, uh, were, were kind of unique, but I don't think it was enough for the cut. Sure. So you're what, roughly about halfway through your university program? Um, uh, or mm-hmm. yeah, close, close enough. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so I'm curious now, this is only, this is only one college, but, um, what kind of technology uh, are in the classes these days? What kind of languages are they asking you to take? What kind of, what kind of classes are required versus optional in the, in the computer science program? Yeah. So when you come to UT, you have to take, there's, I think there's five or six required classes for computer science managers that have to do with computer science. Mm-hmm. You have an intro to programming and data structures, which are kind of what they sound like. Uh, the first one's just, you know, basic Java. Um, the second one deals more with um, algorithms and, you know, kind of stuff to pass technical interviews. Those two are in Java. And then you have computer architecture, which I just completed. That's mostly dealing with C. You do some stuff with assembly in that one and deals with a lot more low level stuff. And that's actually been my favorite computer science class so far. Hmm. Um, I am kind of looking forward to next semester's, which is operating systems. And I'm not sure exactly what language you use in that. I'd imagine we'd be dealing with C a lot just because it's you know, lower level stuff. And then you have two theory classes, which are more math classes than anything like. Um, algorithms and discrete math. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, 
it mostly it's Java and C and um, there's a database class I'm taking next semester that I think is mostly relational. So it's not ancient technology, but I don't, like you're not on the cutting edge. Like I don't think they're teaching like Neo4j or um, React in any classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it is it is hard for it is hard for the curriculum to be formed mm -hmm. around something new when there's by definition eighty percent of the things that are new kind of fade away. Mm -hmm. And so if they did go out for something new, they have an 80% chance of teaching students something that's already become irrelevant or obsolete, yeah, exactly. or at least not fulfilling the dream that it originally was envisioned for. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah. I think like the kind of concept of just teaching you like the underlying concepts and then you go into internships where you get to work with like really learn like the modern tech stacks mm -hmm. and like kind of apply what you learn in college as a good system. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, I remember back in the late 90s, I took a relational database class. And for me, uh, now I had already taught myself how to program, so a lot mm -hmm. of that. But that one was has been foundational. I mean, I, I think back in my career, when would I have learned all that theory just on the job? On the job, I would learn SQL Server and how to store things and whatnot. But actually, the thought process was mm -hmm. behind designing it. So... Um, yeah, and there was talk about relational databases going the way of the dodo bird. No, document databases, blob yeah. storage, all those ideas. Like it had a little nugget of usefulness in certain cases, but the premise that it would become the new normal and relational data would go away, it's, well, it just hasn't happened because relational data is the norm. Oh, and then by the way, some of your data is documents. Some of your data mm -hmm. is JSON or blob. So. Yeah, I think, I think, I think you'll learn a lot in that course, um, yeah. and you'll use it for decades to come too. So, well, this summer, you're, so you're working for Home Depot. Yeah, I am. I just started it on Monday. Nice. Mm -hmm. You yeah. are a professional programmer. If you get paid mm -hmm. to write code, that's the definition. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so, do you already know the the tech stacks that you're using, or did you have to? to ramp up on, on some new ones really quick. Um, we it, we're working on a new project that they want the interns to build. It's supposed to be some internal tool. They haven't directed us towards a tech stack, but I'm not, I, I'm kind of wary of whether they'll uh, let us kind of pick and choose. Um, from what I've seen, just from like, you know, work like kind of looking at like what other people are doing in the company, which I've kind of had the time to explore. Um, before really diving into anything because uh, we're not really working on projects until I think next week. Mm -hmm. um, I think they mostly use, I, I think I'll probably end up using Java um, if we do any backend work and then um, React in the front end, which I mean, it's pretty modern. Like Home Depot is one of the companies that um, if you look at the Glassdoor reviews, they have a pretty modern tech stack for, you know, a retailer, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty nice. And like, um, they build a lot of cool stuff in house that uh, I don't know if I can talk about. But yeah, you can't at any yeah. company. You typically, can't talk about the details. But mm -hmm. um, so with yeah. with your situation, you're already pretty well convinced that you want to be a programmer for the long mm -hmm. term, um, and you're doing enough work where you would have been scared away from it by now if that yeah. wasn't the case. Um, but you know. There are there are students who go all the way through a university program and then come out and then get a job and then realize a few months in, wait a minute, I'm sitting at a desk all day long. I don't like this or I have to stare at a computer screen. Um, and if, how do you classify? How do you classify the things where specifically? you know, you're a lot different from some of your other peers and, and what do it let's, let's talk to the, let's talk to the high school students. What traits might suggest that they are appropriate or wired appropriately for a programming career? What would you say to that? That's kind of a tough one. I think like one of the big weed uh, things to weed out. And I've seen this with a good handful of classmates um, but definitely not a huge portion of them is a lot of people want to do it just for the salary. Cause you know, it's, you get some very attractive salaries, especially once you get up to like the mm -hmm. thing level companies. Yep. Um, I, I think if that's what the reason why you're in it, you're really going to hate it. 
Um, I think you need to have like kind of good, like logical thinking skills, um, math skills, but like, I don't think you have to be like some genius. Like I think when I took the AP exam for calculus, I did not do so well on it. I'm um, given it was senior year with COVID and everything. So I was kind of, uh, checked out. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you need to like have demonstrate a good level of thinking. Cause if you can't think in that way, it's going to be really hard to apply that to a, a computer where all problems eventually break down into, you know, very simple logic. And then you, you need to just like programming, which, I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to determine if you like it or not, but if you're going to the computer to, you know, write some code, I think if you're doing it because, you know, you want to do it, you want to build a cool project, you know, you want to have fun with it. I, I think that means you love programming. If you're doing it because, you know, I need it on my resume, you know, I, if I want to get into a good college, I need to have side projects, then I'd say you're kind of borderline, you know, it's like, like the projects I worked on, uh, yeah, I, I found, you know, once I was doing like, they ask you to estimate the time you've spent on like per week for college applications mm-hmm. that when like I went through and kind of started estimating by like kind of just keeping a clock running. Um, whenever I was working on it, it was like a lot more than I thought it would be like. And I didn't really notice the time passing because, you know, I just come home from school, you know, open it up, try and build like a couple features in because um, that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it's night like that, go down, eat dinner and then repeat. So. It, it, am I safe to say that you had to be called for dinner? <laughs> yeah, I did. Like, um, I, I think like a lot of people like, uh, their parents get on them for playing video games or, um, you, you know, they'll, they'll get on them. Like, you know, you need to spend less time doing X and, you know, go outside or, you know, study or something. Mine was definitely programming. Um, mm-hmm. uh, like I, whenever like my parents would call me and then like, I'd come down like a couple minutes later, cause I wanted to wrap something up and they'd be like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I was working on you know projects and kind of saying like that. Right. Where you kind of put a little bit of guilt on it. Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self-sufficient, moving fast, delivering quality, and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world-class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. I think it is common, at least in my observation as well, uh, the loss, loss, losing track of time, mm-hmm. getting, getting into something and then looking up and another hour has passed and another hour has passed. And how many, how many times did you decide to just not go to sleep because you just couldn't stop what you were engrossed in? I don't think I've only pulled an all nighter once to do that. And it was a hackathon, but I've stayed up pretty routinely till, um, like, pretty late in the night like 3 a.m about to work on stuff like uh i ran cross country in high school Mm -hmm. and you know that's like you have to be practiced at like 6 a.m so you have to get to bed you know pretty early so my typical um the the only day i could really stay up like past 12 would be like saturday because we don't have practice on sunday Mm -hmm. um and pretty much every saturday i would be pushing that into like 2 or 3 a.m working on stuff and then it was really nice because like I really like doing that because I, I generally like kind of feel tired and want to go to sleep, but then I kind of have like that nag to fix like, you know, the one last bug to, you know, get this feature working mm-hmm. and then that'll keep me up another hour or two. And then once you finally get it working, you know, you get kind of get to like lay down and it's like a really nice feeling just lay down after doing that. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, finally work. get some rest. Satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Well, th- I think those are really good, really good signs. Um, really good signs that, that someone may be uniquely wired for a career in programming. Uh, I would agree with those. And, and also on, on the computer, especially when you're on the internet, there's plenty of things to get distracted by. Um, and, and, um, actually some of my, some of my kids peers have told me, um, Oh, I don't watch TV. I just watch YouTube clips. And so there's plenty of things online to get distracted by, but I think maybe another sign is you actually get distracted by coding mm-hmm. because coding seems more interesting than going off and do, you know, looking at something else. Yeah. Do you find yourself as well? You'd rather be programming than 
Good. Yeah, just, I, I do that a lot. And one of the great things about that was um, in high school, typically, if you were like done with your work in a class or like it was a slower day, mm-hmm. um, they, they wouldn't just let you go on YouTube or something because they want you to you know do something school related. Mm-hmm. But I could pretty much always pull up like some project I was working on and just write code for it and wouldn't get questioned because, you know, I was taking computer science class. Right. And I think that was, you know, a really nice thing to be able to do. Okay. Well, with, with, uh, K through 12 schools being kind of hit or miss with the formal teaching of typing, what has your typing journey been? When did you really learn that, that the QWERTY keyboard? Yeah. So I learned it pretty late, I think. Cause in, when we started off in the first computer science class I took in high school, they made us take a typing test. Hmm. And I was around average, I think it was average like in the 40s. I'm, I'm not sure. I go, I was around average. I don't remember the number though. Um, and I was one of like the, I, I wasn't exactly a hunting tech. Like I would kind of like keep my hands like covered over and like I, I would have to look at the keyboard while I typed. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I was doing that for, you know, years while I was coding. And then one day I uh, bought one of those like kind of nicer keyboards, like the mechanical ones that click. And I was like, okay, well, you know, now I should probably sit down for a couple of days and learn how to type. And I went to one of those websites that, um, you know, teaches you how to type. And now I can type if I'm really focused around 80 words per minute. Nice. So I'm not in the, like I have friends who can go up to a hundred. They're insane, but Mm -hmm. um, it it definitely was later. Like I think it was sophomore year in high school when I really got to, you know, typing well. And I think sometimes like when I hit like a key that I don't usually hit, like maybe the uh, left or right arrows, whatever the formal name for those are. Um, I have to look down every now and then, but mm-hmm. I'm pretty good with typing now. Yeah. And then there's the 10 key typing. Of course, on, on laptop keyboards, there's only, there's only the numbers at the top. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, the nicer, the nicer keyboards to go click, clickety clack and yeah. you get the, and the function keys. Uh, the laptop, the modern laptops have basically stolen all of our function keys or put them behind mm-hmm. a, a function lock. Yeah. So, yeah, for, for programmers, we, we've got to have that full 104 key keyboard yeah. and just your hands have to float across it. Um, I don't know what the average is, but I, I do remember being my, I was, I, was a long time ago, I was initially at 40, uh, 40 words per minute in my typing class in seventh grade mm-hmm. um, when they ta- we, we learned on electric typewriters. So oh, cool. I took a typing class in seventh grade way back when. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I lament, uh, so many schools not having formal typing instruction. Do you remember the typing website that worked for you? Yeah, it was typing.com. Oh, okay. Typing. I think I'll, that's, that's pretty popular. We'll put that, we'll put yeah. that in the show notes, um, mm-hmm. just for, for anybody who wants to use it or even has, has kids that just want to tell them, mm-hmm. Hey, sit down for 15 minutes and do this. Yeah. So well, that's good. Um, so, uh, besides for the for the uh, the current uh, the current internship, um, what what languages or tools are you dabbling in at the moment? At the moment, um, one of the tools that I've kind of wanted to use for a while, but um, w- with college, you know, it's so hard to work on side projects that you can like really sink your teeth into. Mm-hmm. But now that it's the summer and I have a little more time. I'm trying to work a little bit more with Neo4j. Mm-hmm. Um, I think about two years ago, I started working with Mongo and like, I was like exploring like the non-relational databases. And I mean, I agree what you said where like everything eventually goes back to where you need relational or where it's going to be a best fit. But the other ones are kind of cool to play around with, especially the multi-model ones. Like I think Arango DB is one of them. I think um, all of the major commercial database engines have gone multiple models just because the market needs it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, I've been kind of playing around with um, different databases. And right now I'm uh, Neo4j. Uh, programming language-wise, I've started to pick up Rust a bit. I have a couple of classmates who really like Rust. And, I mean, I think if you're doing low-level programming or something where you need a lot of speed, it's a really great language. I mean, it's preferable to see, in my opinion, just because it gives you a little bit of safety without a huge performance cut. 
Um, but I think, uh, I think it's a problem right now, at least for me is it's, uh, it's, it's not a super mature language in terms of like ecosystem. Like I think with .NET, like pretty much anything you can think of will be in the NuGet package repository. Mm -hmm. Uh, but with Rust, like I was trying to build something to analyze Wi-Fi packets and I had a pretty, I, I don't think I could find something that could decode the packets for me. So mm, uh, cool. writing and like writing that yourself can be, you know, it's time spent doing something you don't want to do. Right, right, right. So fast forward, um, I don't know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road. Um, there, there's so many different programming jobs. Uh, do you, do you see yourself programming, uh, individually does that really jazz you up or do you like you know, working with other programmers and assembling teams and, and doing larger projects or, or are you still trying to find that out? Uh, I think I'm still kind of in the middle on that because it's nice to have a team to like bounce ideas off of and kind of be able to work together. But at the same time, it's really nice to just be able to get things done kind of, um, on your schedule and the way that you want to do it. Uh, like, it, for instance, at a previous, or I was contracting to um, write some code for a company. Um, I, I still am contracting with them a little bit. Uh, and I had to build a feature to deliver, um, like they want an in-house kind of ad network, which wasn't too bad. They just want ads to show up in certain places, the app that we streamed from S3. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty nice to be able to like decide like all the implementation details on that and how I wanted to do it without having to, you know, have a team meeting, delegate stuff to people. One person doesn't follow a spec. The other person's, you know, a couple days behind and then you integrate it all and it's a mess. <laughs> it's just nice to kind of be able to do something yourself, but it's harder to break up super big tasks like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's, it's a mix. And, and then, and then of course the larger the project becomes, the more impossible it is to do it without a team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so awesome. Well, is there any other any other th learnings that you would, or advice that you would give for the uh, maybe the, the high schooler who not yet not yet uh, interviewed or chosen um, what to do after high school, but really is is jazzed up with programming? Yeah, I would say like the way I learn programming, which I find a good number of people do, but not a whole lot, is to kind of find something within reason that you want to build. Um, like, like a decently sized project when they'll probably take you a couple months to work on at, um, and just try and build that. And you're going to need to, you know, look up a lot of things. You're going to need to do a lot of research, probably have to restart a few times, but it's the best way to get to work with something you really want to work with to kind of build a full experience front to back. Um, you'll be able to learn back end, front end, um, you know, you'll learn how to host stuff on the, you know, different cloud providers. Um, you can learn, you know, your CI CD pipelines and a bunch of other stuff like, um, yeah. Awesome. Well, Nick, thanks so much for, for coming back on the show, uh, and sharing, yeah, of sharing your journey and, and kind of giving, giving the advice for the up and coming future generations of programmers. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been really great. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.